Hello and welcome. I'm Jeunesse Castonguay, VP at Clarius. Thanks for joining us today. We're so glad you're here for our session, Pragmatic MSK Ultrasound, Eight-Step Protocol for Assessing the Distal Biceps Tendon. Over 1,800 clinicians registered for this popular live webinar. You're among physical therapists, sports medicine clinicians, orthopedic surgeons, primary care physicians, emergency doctors, pain management experts, chiropractors, physiatrists, and additional specialists from all corners of the world. Welcome. We're excited to have partnered again with Sonoskills, international leaders in musculoskeletal ultrasound training. In a moment, we'll be joined by founder and renowned educator, Mr. Mark Schmitz, who will teach us his eight-step ultrasound protocol for confidently assessing distal biceps tendon and diagnosing pathologies. With distal biceps tendon injuries, early diagnosis of tendon tear or ruptured with high-resolution ultrasound is key to early treatment and better outcomes. Mr. Schmitz will demonstrate techniques for a thorough, accurate, and confident point-of-care ultrasound assessment, limiting dependence on other costly or ionizing imaging modalities. First, a housekeeping note. Please use the Q&A icon to ask questions at any time. We'll address questions in the live Q&A session following the presentation at the top of the hour. We hope you can stay on for our bonus extended Q&A session with Mr. Schmitz. Now, let me introduce you to your host for today's webinar. Shelly is an experienced sonographer with over 25 years of experience as a clinical ultrasound expert. As clinical manager at Clarius, Shelly is dedicated to providing the highest quality educational content for clinicians looking to add wireless ultrasound to their practice. She helps us deliver practical webinars like today's event and video tutorials for our Claris classroom, which now features over 450 on-demand videos. Hi, Shelly, and over to you. Thanks so much, Janess. And wow, that's uh, got to be close to a record for attendance. That's, that's amazing. I am uh, very excited to be hosting this webinar. I absolutely love MSK Ultrasound, but like many of you watching, uh, there are several areas where I'm not that proficient. And the distal biceps tendon is, is or was one of them. <laughs> um, it's challenging for several reasons, but Mark makes it much less intimidating and learnable. Now, before we get on with the webinar, I'd like to review some literature um, I came across when putting the abstract together. So this first article uh, is from the Journal of Clinical Imaging, and it refers to challenges incurred when attempting to image the biceps tendon. I can totally relate to this and various approaches and techniques that can be used as you'll see shortly. And the next one is, um, it's another abstract and this time from the Journal of Ultrasound in Medicine, which describes yet another way to assess the distal biceps tendon. With a patient in a crab position, 75% of the elbow can be assessed, and then with slight scanner movement and rotation, the distal biceps tendon can be visualized at its insertion, avoiding an anisotropic effect, which uh, we happens often when visualing this tendon, so you'll see some tips and tricks to get around that. And finally, the, this research was based on 120 patients with traumatic injuries, and it was aimed at developing a classification of traumatic distal biceps tendon injuries and analyzed just how sensitive it was for evaluating the distal biceps injuries and the compared ultrasound to MRI. Um, and they concluded that ultrasound can be used as a first line imaging modality to evaluate distal biceps tendon injuries. And just before we get started, we just like to put a little poll out there. Um, when you come across MSK injuries or abnormalities, which of these challenges have you encountered in treating MSK concerns? And please select all that apply. Are you looking at a broad differential? Are you worried about a mistaken diagnosis and therefore suboptimal treatment? We'll just give this a couple of seconds. Three, two, one. All right, so the majority are worried about a mistaken diagnosis, and I think part of that as well goes along with the broad differential. So um, Mark is going to be showing us some great pathology as well, so hopefully this will help out. So now I would like to introduce Mr. Mark Schmitz, founder and CEO of Sonoskills, joining us all the way from the Netherlands. Mark is an expert in the area of MSK ultrasound, so much so that he began developing his own courses, and Sonoskills was formed in 2010. They are now a team of 22 expert trainers and have taught courses in 30 countries. Now, besides managing Sonoskills, 
Mark teaches foundational, intermediate, and advanced level courses. I'm a huge fan of Mark and Sonal Skills and all of their teaching. Welcome, Mark, and I will hand the presentation over to you. Thank you, Shelley. So it's very good uh, to be here. So great, everybody. Um, yeah, so we're going to discuss the uh, distal biceps tendon. It's a, uh, it's, a, it's a clinical relevant structure, and it is a structure which, if you want to uh, assess it uh, uh, yeah, in, a, in a good way, it can be quite challenging. So we developed an eight-step protocol to make sure that you are, at the end of this uh, webinar, perfect, uh, capable to uh, scan this distal biceps tendon. If you use this protocol, then uh, it should be easy in clinical practice to uh, say something about the, uh, the biceps, because now at the moment, lots of MRI scans are being make, made of the distal biceps, but I would say that is not necessary because with this uh, protocol, uh, I would say that ultrasound, um, the ultrasound feed is already sufficient to make your clinical decision making and your clinical uh, to do your clinical reasoning. Okay, so let's get uh, started. Um, there is uh, nothing to disclose, uh, so there is not no conflict of interest with anything that is presented in this uh, material. So, like Shelley uh, introduced, I'm the founder of Sonus Skills, and we love MSK ultrasound. We teach lots of uh, people uh, around the world online and also in our hands-on courses and we have a free website uh, for you to visit ultrasoundcases.info contains more than 7,000 pathology cases and if you check those you can really steepen your learning curve by just browsing through these free this free content so let's first talk about a little bit about the anatomy because this is important to know uh, this affects also your scanning and also your clinical reasoning uh, the distal biceps tendon flows, of course, from the musculotendinous junction, which flows from the biceps muscle belly. And we know that the biceps has two parts, a long part and a short part. And uh, this will also reflect in the tendon. You have a long part of the tendon and a short part of the tendon. It's not only the tendon which inserts to the radial tuberosity, and this tuberosity is located uh, in between the radius and the ulna, uh, but there is also a biceps aponeurosis, or in Latin, a lacertus fibrosis, which uh, flows from the distal biceps tendon into the uh, flexor muscles of the forearm. And this lacertus fibrosis is something that we are also going to uh, check with, uh, with ultrasound. You can see that the radial tuberosity, the insertion of the uh, tendon, that it is located quite in the middle of the joint. So you would need to, uh, to you need to make a strong supination, a maximum supination with the patient's forearm, so that the uh, radial tuberosity comes more to superficial and allows uh, ultrasound uh, uh, assessment. Here you can see the splitting of uh, the tendon. This is, of course, a artificial split. In reality, there is not, not uh, such a big gap between those parts. This is the longest, the long part. That's the superficial part. And we have the uh, uh, distal part, which is the short part of the tendon. And you can see that on this uh, radial tuberosity, they have a certain cross-sectional area, uh, long proximal and short distal. Here as well, the long part proximal, short part uh, distal uh, on the radial tuberosity. And this distal biceps tendon has a spiral um, uh, configuration. So uh, at biceps muscle and musculotendinous level, the long and the short head, they are positioned next to each other. Uh, but uh, then they spiral and at uh, radial tuberosity level, they are um, yeah, positioned on top of each other. And here we can see the lacertus fibrosis, uh, this fascia layer expanding into the uh, flexor muscles. This is uh, only a very thin uh, uh, yeah, fascia layer. So if we are going to look at that, don't expect a huge mass or a huge structure. It's only very thin, but it's strong. It's very strong. And uh, this um, uh, really is important. Uh, to, to know if it's torn because it helps you to understand the degree of retraction. Uh, so if the distal biceps tendon uh, is completely torn, it will retract 
and uh, this Lasertes fibrosis will influence this retraction. And we're going to discuss that later on in this, uh, this webinar. So let's uh, summarize some knowledge about the distal biceps. It's a flat tendon. It has no tendon sheath. So meaning there is no such thing as a tenosynovitis of the distal biceps tendon, like the proximal uh, biceps tendon in the shoulder. And um, in most people, it's uh, two tendons, the short and the long head. Sometimes there are some anatomical variations. And uh, we have seen that the footprint is uh, overly shaped uh, at the radial uh, tuberosity. And if you want to know something about dimensions, so here you can see uh, the dimensions. And we already talked about the Lasertes fibrosis or the biceps aponeurosis, which is important for stabilizing the distal biceps tendon. Hence also the problem with the retraction. Huh? So if it's torn, there is no stability anymore and the tendon will retract. Um, but it also helps in load distribution that not every load is being transferred to the radial tuberosity, but that some of the loading is being absorbed by the flexor muscles. And not discussed yet, but it's also there. There is a bicipital bursa. This bursa is surrounding the insertion of the biceps tendon. So there could be a fluid collection around the tendon. And then for you, it's important to, uh, to differentiate between is it a tendon problem? Is it a bursal problem? Or maybe both? Let's discuss that also later in the pathology section of this webinar. So as soon as skills uh, saw among the thousands of people we trained that there is some, some difficulty with understanding the biceps. So we came up with this uh, eight-step protocol. It's uh, about a clinical examination. It's about looking at several angles to the distal biceps tendon. We have a ventral angle, we have a dorsal angle, we have a medial approach and a lateral approach. And then in the end, there is a pathology cl uh, classification. And with that, we uh, use for that to do, we use the Sonus Skills Pathology Checklist, which I will explain. And I'm going to also explain a classification system which helps you, which helps you to understand which degree or which severity of the, the pathology is, uh, is there. And maybe from there, you can do your clinical decision-making, what to do with the patient. So let's first go to the first step. And every patient you will see you will start with an inspection. And if there is a complete tear, and also if the Lasertes fibrosis is torn, you will see and note a reverse Popeye sign. So the muscle belly of the biceps will retract to proximal, leaving the patient with a very large lump on the arm. This is the, 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 the biceps muscle which uh, has been retracted. If the Lasertes fibrosis is not torn, but the biceps tendon is, Lasertes fibrosis is not, then you will most likely see, not see this reverse Popeye sign. So diagnosis is very easy. If you see this, then you know, complete tear and also Lasertes fibrosis is torn. If you don't see a reverse Popeye sign, then it becomes more challenging and you need to do additional uh, clinical examination and maybe also ultrasound. We can do, of course, provocations tests. So to a resistance, we could do this in supination and also in pronation and to see how much strength uh, there is. You could do a hook test. This is uh, important. Um, we, you, in the anterior elbow crease, uh, you, uh, with a healthy tendon, you will feel a vertical, um, quite of a tough structure, a hard structure, which is the biceps tendon especially if you give a certain resistance to the elbow flexion, then the biceps tendon uh, uh, tightens. But if it's uh, a empty feel, a soft feel, that you don't feel this hard structure there, this is really an important indication that a complete tear might be present. And we could also do a flexion initiation test. So in this research of Bono et al. in 2021, they looked at 125 patients. And if the flexion initiation test and the hook test is positive, then there is a very high clinical confidence uh, to immediately proceed to operative repair, meaning that there is a complete tear, need surgery, you don't have to do uh, additional medical imaging. So if fit and hook tests are positive, 
you actually don't have to do a ultrasound. Maybe I would look anyway because I'm a sonoholic and I want to see what the what the uh, uh, the, uh, the the status is. And uh, in many cases, I won't charge the patient for that because I just want to know myself. But um, uh, indication for ultrasound is not really there. There is a indication for ultrasound or additional medical imaging, if, for example one of the tests is positive and the other is negative, or if both tests are negative. In that case, there might be doubt uh, about, the, um, about the pathology, or maybe uh, that you're not sure what the details are of the pathology. Is it partially torn? If yes, to what degree? Is it not torn, but is it a tendinopathy? Is it not a tendinopathy, but maybe a bazitis, or is it maybe a mixed image? So this, uh, for that to solve that puzzle, you really need additional medical imaging. And yeah, here they propose MRI, but I would say, and uh, maybe you agree with me after this webinar that you also can use ultrasound. So the diagnosis of uh, complete, complete, that's important to understand, complete tearing is mainly clinical. But for other uh, pathologies like partial tears or tendinopathies, a medical imaging is a valuable addition to your clinical diagnosis. So let's uh, go to the second and also the third step. In the second step, we look have a ventral approach to the distal biceps um, uh, in a short axis view. Um, but in, uh, in step three, we also have a ventral approach, but then in a longitudinal view. So both steps are captured in a video to which I will discuss. Um, so let's have a look at the video. So we're going to place for step two, the transverse view, the uh, transducer on top of the ventral elbow. And uh, then you will see that uh, the, there is this typical trochlea line of the elbow. So that is our landmark. This is uh, the bone. Uh, on top of that, we can see cartilage. On top of that, a hypercoat line is the capsule of the elbow. And on top of that, we see a large muscle belly, which is the brachial uh, muscle. So that's the median nerve, that's the brachial artery, that's the cephalic vein. And in between the cephalic vein and the brachial artery, uh, we can see a structure and that is the distal biceps tendon. So maybe you're not really sure if this is a tendon because there are quite some hyperchoic elements to that. So what you could do, you could follow the biceps uh, tendon to proximal and to see if this transforms into a muscle belly. And yes, here you can see that it is turning into a muscle belly within the middle. We can see this hyperchoic aponeurosis in between the muscle fibers. So you, then you know, yes, this is indeed the biceps muscle tendinous junction. Now, going back to distal, so the aponeurosis disappears and transforms into the tendon. And then uh, you can look at the tendon and follow the tendon uh, to uh, distal. Um, so let me see what I'm going to do now. So it's not only about the um, uh, tendon, it's also about the lacertus fibrosis, and I will discuss that a little bit later. So now I'm following the biceps to distal, and this is quite challenging. So you need to toggle or tilt your transducer a lot in order to keep it hyperechoic. And this is not easy. So keep the arm of the patient in full supination, toggle, and maybe also push a little bit, uh, sonopalpation to have the optimal view. But in the end, this view in most cases is a little bit limiting to assess the last part of the distal biceps. This part to me is especially good to look at the uh, uh, tendon at the uh, brachial artery uh, level, also to look at the muscular tendinous junction and also the distal part of uh, the muscle. So um, here we can see again the transverse uh, muscle belly, and now it's indicating the uh, biceps aponeurosis, which is lying on top of the, the pronator teres muscle. This is a hyperchoic line, this fascia layer, like mentioned, it's very thin, um, but if you look closely, this hyperchoic line is a little bit thicker, increased thickness, to a normal epimysium layer around the muscle. And this increased thickness is indeed the uh, biceps aponeurosis or the lacertus fibrosis. If torn, this hyperchoic line will be thickened, will be more hyperchoic. 
Okay, so let's go to step three of the protocol, and that's the longitudinal view. And for longitudinal view, we are going to look at that's yeah, that's the humerus, that's the joint, humeral radial joint, that's the radial bone, radial neck, radial shaft. And there we can see the radial tuberosity, and we can only see it due to the supination of the patient. And there we can see part, a little part of the insertion of the tendon. But again, it's challenging. It's not optimal. I have much better um, views on the distal insertion for you in the dorsal approach. That's the next one. But let's focus first on the um, uh, this uh, third step, the longitudinal one. Um, the, the brachial artery is very close. So if you are looking for the tendon it's also possible that you will be scanning the artery and if you do if, if that's the fact then you need to go a little bit more to lateral where you can find the uh, distal uh, biceps okay so let's go to step four uh, step four is the dorsal approach uh, to the biceps and uh, it's in longitudinal and we also have a dynamical test i love dynamical testings i think that it is being done too uh, not enough in an msk ultrasound uh, but that's another discussion um, and also looking at step five is also the dorsal approach and this is uh, the same position, but then in transverse view. And let's have a look at that. And this is my favorite approach. And it has a very cool name. It's the Cobra position. Uh, if you ever seen the movie Kill Bill uh, with the, 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 the Cobra uh, movements, uh, the Cobra fighting techniques. Well, so this is the same technique. The patient's arm is resting on the elbow, fully flexion, arm in pronation. What we see is the ulna bone right there. We can see the radial bone right here. And on top of the radial bone, we can see a small hyperchoic uh, tendon. And this one is um, now moving uh, with this bone supination in between the uh, ulna and the uh, radial uh, bone. And now you can see beautiful the, beautifully the attachment, the distal biceps tendon attachment to the radial uh, tuberosity. We can observe the integrity of the tendon. We can see, observe if there is a, a bursitis. We can see if there are calcifications and even if there is an impingement in between the uh, ulna and the radius in the radial ulna joint. And it's a very easy technique to do. So you place it, you can see where the transducer placement is. And now it's the dynamic technique making a pro and supination in this uh, cobra uh, position. So you can see beautifully the uh, radius uh, pro and supinating and yeah, the, the, uh, yeah, a perfect view on the insertion. So what we were missing in the ventral approach, we can see now in the uh, dorsal approach. Okay, so after we have scanned the um, in this distal tendon in transverse view, then we are going to turn the transducer in, uh, or in longitudinal view, we're going to turn the transducer in uh, transverse view. So now uh, the uh, radial tuberosity is visualized in transverse. Right to the screen, you can see the radial head. Now the laser pointer is indicating the radial tuberosity with on top of the tuberosity you can see the uh, distal biceps uh, insertion in cross-sectional area and you can see how wide or how long the insertion actually is this is a very nice technique which you don't see much in uh, books and articles i can really recommend you also adopting this one in your skill set in um, the sixth um, uh, step, we do the medial approach of the distal biceps tendon. So the transducer is being placed on the medial epicondyle. You can see that the transducer is aligned in, with the, the, the humeral shaft. And from this position, we're going to glide to distal, but also a little bit to ventral. Yes, they're a little bit too ventral. And what you're looking for is a landmark, a very nice landmark, and that's the brachial artery. There it is, the brachial artery, very beautiful on screen. You can see the anechoic structure. And this is nice because it's not only a, um, a, a, a landmark, but it's also a acoustic window, which vis visualizes the tendon underneath a little bit uh, better. 
So that is indeed the again the distal tendon. You can see now you can see now the tendon over a longer stretch and also the insertion. So with the dorsal approach, we had a better view on the insertion, but it was only a, a, a tiny bit. Now we can see uh, the insertion, not as clear with the dorsal approach, but we can see it, but we can see much more the last few centimeters of the uh, insertion. So this really helps to understand uh, uh, the, if you're looking for retraction, how far is a tendon, for example, uh, retracted. Then we have a seventh step, that's the lateral approach um, uh, and also a dynamical test again, you know, I like that. And in this uh, dynamical uh, uh, test uh, and this lateral approach, you can see that the patient is now putting the, the arm on the table. In the previous one, it was slightly flexed, but now it's again, loose, relaxed on the table, placing the transducer in transverse view over the radial bone. Uh, over the uh, brachioradialis and the extensor carpi radialis muscle. And we can see the supinatal muscle wrapping around the radial bone. And now the pointer is indicating the horizontal hyperechoic fibers of the distal biceps tendon. We don't see the insertion right now. That one has disappeared in this black zone underneath the bone in this acoustic shadowing. Um, but now we can see another part of the tendon. And with this dynamical movement, pro and supination I'm making there with uh, the, the model, you can see also the, the tendon moving. So if I would be pro and supinating and I don't see anything moving, then you know that the biceps is uh, torn. Good. So next to visiting uh, clarius.com, I also encourage you to visit sonaskills.com. We have many courses online and hands-on courses around the world. So there might be one close to you. It would be really nice to meet up in a person. So looking at, uh, we explained you now uh, the sono anatomy, uh, the technical scanning details. Uh, and later on, Shelly is also going to uh, demonstrate uh, what I just have uh, explained. And we will discuss it again. Um, yeah, so looking at the distal biceps uh, pathology, we know that it happens a little bit less than the proximal biceps tendons that oc occurs uh, yeah, more often, but it occurs mainly in men aging 40 to 60. And it has something to do with uh, decreasing physical condition, but uh, sometimes still uh, heavy lifting, weight lifting, or physical labor. Um, uh, it is quite strong correlation with uh, smoking and also some systemic uh, diseases. It is mainly happening due to a single traumatic event. So this could be either a sudden a eccentric load applied to a flex elbow. So there is a, a flex elbow and uh, maybe somebody uh, uh, miscalculated a weight or something is dropping and you try to catch it. And then due to this sudden uh, movement, this eccentric load in this flex position, the tendon will uh, tear. Or sometimes a forceful hyperextension and then still uh, a strong resist resistance, the tendon will tear. Patients will feel a pop or a sharp pain in this anterior elbow crease, the, the, the fossa. And the, immediately they will, if it's completely torn, they will feel a weakness in the flexion of the elbow, but also in the supination. So you might see bruising, so also keep your eye on that in the clinical examination. And those first two weeks, and I would actually say the first week is really important that you see those patients uh, because it's important for diagnostic, but also for surgical repair if uh, necessary. So do your clinical ex examination, do your hook test uh, uh, for feeling if there is a palpable, palpable defect or to look at the tendon retraction. And then uh, you also wanna know, is the Lacertus fibrosis uh, torn? So mostly the tear is happening one to two centimeters away from the insertion. This is a hypoavascular zone, uh, on a little bit higher and lower. The tendon is quite strong in vascularization, but this, this, this typical part, one to two centimeters, that, that's a poor vascularized zone and therefore more at risk for uh, tearing. Partial tearing is a little bit uh, more uncommon than uh, complete uh, tearing, but you know, there's always a process uh, underneath because 
nothing tears at once. There's always a, that's a continuum. A tendon is healthy, is uh, degenerating, is starting to get a tendinopathy, maybe some small micro ruptures or a little stronger or, or larger partial tearing. And then at what time it pops, it completely tears. So this is a disease process which uh, happens in time. And um, yeah, and, and expect also a bursitis and ultrasound is a perfect tool to see whether there is a bursitis or not. So we have uh, a pitfall, and that is that if the Lacertus fibrosis or the bicipital aponeurosis is intact, this can make the clinical diagnosis a little bit more difficult because then you won't see the reverse Popeye sign. If the Lacertus fibrosis is torn, the biceps will retract with a complete tear more than eight centimeters. But if it's not torn, it will be less than eight centimeters, and that will be a little bit more challenging. Um, and the second pitfall is that uh, the biceps could be bifurcated, right? So we have the long, two, the long one and the short one. If only one of them is torn, then yeah, um, clinical examination, that might be still okay. Strength will also be okay, but uh, there is a problem. And uh, therefore I always recommend do an ultrasound because you never know uh, if only one ten part of the tendon is affected. So many diseases uh, are, uh, uh, yeah, are, are, are possible and many changes in MSK ultrasound uh, uh, could be possible. So there is a whole list of this. So I would say pause the video and go over these uh, bullet points. I want to discuss with you now the sonopathology. How does it look like in uh, ultrasound? And before I do that, I just want to point out that in this research, uh, I always, at Sonus Skills, we always use this article because it really helps you in understanding when is it, does it make sense to do an ultrasound with, with which pathologies. And they scored all kinds of injuries, uh, one, zero, one, two, or three. Uh, three uh, meaning ultrasound is the preferred imaging tool. Two meaning ultrasound is equivalent to other medical imaging techniques like MRI. One is um, ultrasound you can do if MRI is not available, and zero is don't do ultrasound. So you can see that for the distal bicep tendon, uh, it scores a two equivalent to MRI. And in that case, I would say do ultrasound because MRI is more expensive, it's, more, it's not so patient friendly, um, it's less uh, dynamic. You can do dynamical tests. It is a little bit fixed. You, well, you, you cannot jump from one part to the other part. Uh, so I would recommend doing ultrasound. And that leaves us with the last and eighth step of the Sooner Skills uh, biceps, distal, distal biceps protocol, the eight step protocol. And that is, we are going to classify um, and look at, the, to classify the pathologies and we're going to assess the pathologies in a very standardized step-by-step -step way. And for this step-by-step -step, uh, analysis, we're going to use the Sonus Skills Pathology Checklist. We're going to look first at five points. First, the shape has the morphology change. Has the tendon increase in thickness or increase in cross-sectional area or has the bursa uh, change in size? Secondly, we're going to look at the echogenicity. Has the tendon become more hyperechoic, hypoechoic, or maybe even anechoic? How is the continuity? of the tendon or the muscular tendon at junction, or even at the insertion at the bone. Are there any Doppler signs? Uh, neovascularization, important to look at. And of course, functional, how does the anatomy move? So if we have a hypothesis based on these five points, uh, then uh, make sure that you always scan in two planes. You could also compare left to right. People have two biceps, so um, that is easy to do. And of course, make sure that you uh, assess the clinical relevance of the changes. So uh, Shelley, she um, uh, showed an article in the beginning, and this is exactly uh, the, um, uh, the same article I'm, I also use. So I can really recommend you reading that one. Um, and in the poll, you mentioned that you, you struggle with the, with the pathology recognition and how sure you are about if this is truly uh, pathological. And I'm going to show you this classification system. The, this classification system uh, has uh, three types. Uh, type one, no tearing. Type two, two, a partial tearing. And type three, a complete tearing. 
So let's go over these three types and I will show you pathology case examples. So first a type 1A, so 1A, so no tearing. Uh, there is a tendinopathy and it particularly uh, affects one of the two tendons. So either the short one or the long one is affected and the other, other one isn't. So um, let's, in this image, zoom into the uh, short axis view. We can see that one part of the tendon is okay. It is hyperchoic, it looks nice. Uh, but the other part is quite dark, quite hyperchoic and also enlarged. So you can, but there is no signs of tearing. So it is a tendinopathy. So uh, you can see that only one part is affected meaning it's a type 1a pathology because it's not torn tendinopathy of only one part. In type 2b, you can see that the full thickness of uh, the whole tendon is, uh, is affected. Uh, so uh, so uh, not torn, but a state of tendinopathy. And if we look at the cross-sectional area in this ventral approach, then you can see that the tendon has enlarged. Usually the tendon is not bigger than the brachial artery. It's, it's a little bit overly shaped, but now it's massively increased in thickness. And you know that if it's larger, it's swollen. If it's swollen, it's softer. If it's softer, it becomes more hypochoic. And still, we see connective tissue. We don't see any signs of tearing. So there's a tendinopathy and not a, a partial tear. Uh, same thing, we can see at the level of the insertion a very strong increased cross-sectional area. We can see also in this longitudinal view that it's become darker, hyperchoic. That's even neovascularization. Think about checkpoint four of the Sonar Scales Pathology Checklist. So meaning hyperemia, it's a painful state of this tendinopathic uh, tendon. The whole tendon affected, type 1b. So in type 2a, the tendon is partially torn and it could be either a low grade, meaning that 50% or less of the tendon is affected. It could also be high grade, more than 50% is affected. So first a low grade injury, and then we can see that there's only a minor fraying of the tendon, a small partial tear. This part of the tendon is still intact. There is a little bit of fluid at the place of the partial tear. So uh, a type 2a, because it's less than 50% partially torn. Um, um, yes, I might go to this one. Uh, in type 2b, uh, then more than 50% of the distal biceps tendon is uh, affected. So here we can see that uh, this part is affected, right? So we can see that the continuity of this part is affected, it's interrupted, and that this part is still intact. So I would say this is 60 to 70%. This is um, yeah, around 30, 35%, meaning more than 50% affected, meaning a type two pathology. So part is still there, but most of the tendon is partially torn. And you can see that a partial tear goes together also with the tendinopathy because the tendon here is also thickened. We can see a more hypochoic appearance of this uh, distal biceps tendon. So in type 2C, we can see that uh, the full thickness of a single biceps tendon is torn, but the other part is still intact, right? So now you can see, for example, in this uh, cross-sectional image that one part is still healthy, nice, hyperchoic, oval-shaped, but that the other part, the, in this case the short part, is completely torn, anechoic, fluid, no fibers intact, meaning that, well, yeah, it is a partially uh, affected tendon, but it's one whole part of a tendon, meaning a type 2C pathology. And here also in this operative uh, view, we can see that parts of the tendon are affected and that other parts of the tendon are uh, intact in this same patient. And then we have type 3A, that's the non-retracted part. Uh, less than eight centimeters. And that means that the tendon, yes, completely torn. You have a positive hook test, 
but the uh, reverse papa sign you might not see due to a intact uh, biceps aponeurosis or lacertus fibrosis. And it might be hypertrophied. So this little li white line on top of the pronata teres might be uh, thickened and more hyperchoic, but it is intact. So the tendon will not retract as much as uh, you would expect it to be. So for example, this case, this is the radial tuberosity, completely uh, tear of the biceps. There is a retraction, but it's only one and a half centimeters or one, 15 millimeters. And here we can see the stump of the distal biceps tendon, thickened, hypochoic. Uh, also in cross-sectional area, this is the stump, but it's still not that far retracted due to an intact Lacertus fibrosis. And last one is type 3B. This is a complete tear of the biceps, including the biceps aponeurosis, the Lacertus fibrosis, Everything is done. Patient has a reverse papa sign, and you will find the uh, the bicep tendon probably most likely in eventful view, uh, completely retracted to proximal. Uh, the stump is there. There is lots of fluids in longitudinal and also short axis view. And also in this case, uh, we can see that uh, the stump of the biceps is uh, right here. Uh, and in this lateral view, we can see an empty space right here. Uh, and we can see this stump of the biceps uh, right uh, here. So even if you would uh, go to in this position to pro and supination, you won't see the biceps moving because there's only a stump at that uh, location. In this case, uh, we can see that in this lateral view, that after a surgery, after a repair, we can still see part of the repair in the tendon. Um, so, and with moving this uh, repair, these sutures, it, they disappear also underneath the uh, radial bone. So you also pass operatively, you can track the, the healing of the, the tendon. So we have not discussed that much about the bispital radial bursitis. So this one is surrounding the whole um, uh, bursa. And I'm almost ready. So I know I'm talking a lot, but I'm enthusiastic about this topic. Um, so concluding almost the presentation, and then I will hand it back to, uh, to Shelley. So we see the bursa wrapping around the, uh, the biceps tendon. And you can imagine if you have a fluid collection that needs to fit into this space, that that will be a problem and leading to an impingement for the patient. So this distal, uh, or this bursitis, um, uh, yeah, does not communicate with the joint cavity. Um, and yeah, well, what I mentioned, it is wrapping around the whole tendon. So here we can see a bursitis um, uh, on top of uh, and next to the biceps tendon. You can see that it is a little bit thinner here. It's thickened there, and then it's, uh, it, 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 yeah, it, it, it is disappearing right there. So this is important to know so that you don't make the mistake um, or that, that this is not an artery uh, because the, the brachial artery is also closed. So you need to... Uh, uh, differentiate between a bursa, uh, bursitis and an artery. And this does not have the shape of an artery. This is a bursitis. And you can see that the bursa has a cl very clear anechoic uh, fluid. Uh, so that's okay. Here also we can see fluids wrapping around the distal biceps. Here in this case, we can see the uh, radial, uh, the brachial artery on top of uh, the, uh, uh, the the tendon. So this is the ventral approach, longitudinal, close to the um, close to the, uh, uh, to the to the insertion at the radial tuberosity. So I would suggest to you that uh, whenever you see a fluid collection on top of the biceps, switch on your Doppler mode to see if you if you see any pulsation, just to exclude. Uh, bursal fluid with the artery. And by the way, if it's artery, you should also see pulsating. That's another topic. But uh, if you are in doubt, use the Doppler view. So if you have any questions left after this webinar, or if you see this we uh, webinar later, so on demand, then, uh, and you still have questions, you can always send me an email to mark at or we can connect on LinkedIn. You can send me a direct message. I will happily, happy to, uh, to answer all of your questions. But for all the people now live in this webinar, uh, in a few minutes, then there is a Q&A with Shelly and me. 
And uh, I, yeah, I would be happy to answer all your questions. Shelley, back to you. Thank you, Mark. That was fantastic. Um, yes, so encourage everybody to ask questions that we will get to. I'm going to head over and do a live demo now. And Mark's going to just kind of walk me through the process. We may go a few minutes over if we have lots of questions. All right, good. So I've chosen the L15 scanner, just like the one Mark was using. Give your arm straight out. Yeah, that's good. And I'm using the elbow preset. And I'm also going to just activate my voice controls here so that I can operate the um, functions without um, touching the screen. I think, I think that's a really cool uh, tool, the voice control. It, it's, it's pretty great because if you are doing dynamic motions, uh, dynamic procedures, you, uh, you don't need the, uh, another hand to, uh, yeah, to yeah. You know, increase depth, for example, or decrease depth. Good. So I'm just starting um, an medial elbow here. And what I'm seeing is the brachial artery over here, the cephalic vein, and right in between is a nice cross-sectional view of the biceps tendon, yep. distal biceps tendon. And like you said, Mark, if I just scan more proximally, we can see that that does become the bicep muscle. So I'm I'm sure that that's what that is. Yep. <laughs> right on the money, and, yep. Yeah. And then if I just want to look for the uh, Lacertus fibrosis. Yeah, for that, it's important to keep the brachial artery in the middle. And then um, maybe even a little bit more in this case to the left of the screen, and then the pronata teres muscle will uh, will uh, be visualized. And you, uh, yeah, that's that's perfect. And then on top of the muscle belly, you can see a hyperechoic line. Indeed, right that's there. the one. That's your okay. aponeurosis. Yeah. Okay, great. So if I just um, focus back on the biceps tendon here, I'm just going to try to scan distally and see how far I can follow this. And as you mentioned, Mark, it just requires a little bit of um, kind of toggling of the scanner yes. just to avoid the anisotrophy, but it is it is tricky. Um, it does dive deep here. And uh, so I'm just kind of trying to trying to optimize my view, but yeah. I, you know, the further down yeah, I get, it. the more challenging it is yeah. here. So you're quite um, close to the insertion there. Okay, yep. okay, great. Um, good, and so then if I want to just Rotate my scanner into long axis. So we get a long axis view of that of that um, biceps tendon. So I am seeing some of the fibers here. Yep, perfect. And then if I just scan a little bit more distally, we're still seeing it here. And it just gets a little bit more challenging down further as I get to the radial yep. tuberosity here. Nice. Yeah, so the key is maximum supination of the patient, and you're doing that correctly. I can see okay, the great. And this is a bonus. I would say from a ventral approach, I never expect to see the insertion to the bone. That's okay. a bonus if you do. I want to see <laughs> it in the dorsal approach or in the medial approach, but this is good. Yeah, nice. Okay, all right, good. Yeah, and I'm leaning quite uh, quite hard on the uh, on the bottom of the scanner. So, so the yeah. next view we'll do is the Cobra. <laughs> Yes, the Cobra. Or the Kill Bill, like you said, my favorite movie. Yeah. <laughs> Great. And so here we are seeing the radius. Yeah. And we are seeing the insertion here. Yeah. And again, if I just do that dynamic motion, we can, we can see that in here. I'm seeing a little bit of an echogenic thing in the middle of that mark. Yeah, I can see it as well. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there. Yeah. All right, good. Small calcification. Okay. And then again, if I just rotate the scanner 90 degrees to look at that in long axis. Yeah, this is also a great one. Yeah. I don't understand why they don't talk about it more. Yeah. In the results, but it's really nice to see the it, whole overview amazing. of the, um, the, uh, this, this radial tuberosity the insertion. and insertion. Great. Don't get it quite as nicely as you, but I just need I just need a little bit more practice. <laughs> no, that's okay. So that's okay. Good. That so is... then, if I if we just go from the lateral approach here, so we're going to look for the the radial bone in transverse, and then if I just move, I'm going to have to increase my depth 
increase depth. Great. Good. And then here is the length yeah. of the tendon perfect. here. This is perfect. Okay. And from there, you can do the dynamical assessments, prone supination to observe the tendon kinematics. Yeah. And all the while, I'm just keeping the scanner in the same place and watching that. Yeah. The dynamic motion. Perfect. Fantastic. Great. Good. And then the last view is we'll just have the arm partially flexed. Yeah. This one's a little flexion. bit tricky. And I'll just start uh, lengthwise on the humerus and slide and look for that brachial artery that's going to be the the wind the the window to the insertion which mm -hmm. there it is right there yeah, perfect oh that's a nice one yes mm -hmm. this is good yeah not so pretty i'm going to take a picture of it yeah this is really good <laughs> can get better so that was the perfect one good yeah. yeah so you did good so right. this is uh, the the, uh, the 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 sonography part of the protocol okay well that's great and you can see then how many, how few minutes, and you you were talking as well. So, and how many minutes you can do it. So it's you could do it in three minutes. You have a full view over the whole distal bicep tendon. It's much quicker than doing an MRI. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. And you get to talk to your patient and 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 ask where it hurts as well, right? Yeah, <laughs> which is so great. Okay, so I'm just gonna, um, while we're waiting for the last couple of questions, I'll just head back to Jeunesse just to talk about the product for a few minutes and then we will get to your questions. Yes. Thank you so much, Shelley and Mr. Schmitz for the fabulous live demonstration. Before we open up the floor to questions, we are going to ask a quick poll. We'd love to help everyone continue on their journey in bringing high definition handheld ultrasound to their practice. So please complete this poll if we can provide more information for you. And you can click on as many options as apply. Pricing and availability varies by region, so please request a quote in pricing. You may opt to speak to one of our experts about the advantages of wireless ultrasound. If you'd like to discuss scanner features, please select that option. You can book a virtual one-on-one -on -one demo with our experts to see the new Claris HD3 in action in a highly interactive one-on-one -on -one session. And we can send you more video tutorials for MSK ultrasound. So please go ahead and select as many options as you wish. While you complete the live poll, I'll take a minute to introduce you to the Claris HD3, the world's only third generation line of portable ultrasound scanners. Our best in class linear scanners are unrivaled for near field and high resolution musculoskeletal imaging and, pr and procedure guidance with an easy to use app powered by artificial intelligence and connected to the cloud. Today, you saw how Claris supports a confident diagnosis with high resolution imaging of muscles, joints, ligaments, tendons, and cartilage, both at rest and in motion. The secret lies in each scanner being designed with not one or two, but eight beam formers, 192 elements, and AI that together deliver the image quality only found in compact systems, but at a fraction of the cost, representing 85% savings. With AI replacing complex knobs and buttons, it's as easy to use as your smartphone, so you can quickly diagnose MSK injuries, guide management, and also use it for safe ultrasound-guided procedures like pain medicine injections. Claris is also wireless, freeing up space with zero footprint for ultra portability in a variety of settings. You get free movement, but no wires getting in the way, which also makes Claris so much faster to clean, disinfect, and fully encase in a sterile bag. Only Claris delivers linear scanners with an ecosystem that includes a free app for your iOS or Android devices for unlimited users. Available with our membership, Claris Cloud is used to easily capture and manage unlimited exams from anywhere. Your membership also includes in-app Claris classroom videos with experts like Mr. Schmitz, and onboarding with a Claris clinician to build your skills. Claris Live delivers one-click telemedicine if you'd like to share live scanning with a colleague for a second opinion. And with our membership, you also get our advanced MSK package that includes dedicated presets and in the USA features the FDA-approved MSK AI that automatically identifies, highlights, and measures the thickest section of tendons in the foot, ankle, and knee. If you asked for more information or ask for more information now, we will get back to you in the coming week. I'd like to welcome back Mr. Schmitz and Shelley to answer your questions. 
please use the questions icon in the menu bar to ask your questions of our great clinicians. Shelly, if I could ask you to moderate, please. Absolutely. Um, and there's a few here that are in uh, Dutch, I believe, <laughs> Mark. So you may you may be on your own for that one. But uh, the, the first question I'll ask is, uh, does this type of tendon rupture correlate with past quinolone use? Uh, the, the last part of the question is, understand. does this type of uh, pathology correlate to? Tendon rupture correlate with quinolone use? Um, I'm not sure if not I hear sure. it correctly, but uh, uh, I don't have a answer to that so um, i'm not totally familiar with the last part of the the question okay okay um and one question is do we mention the short head or the long head affected like i guess do you are you yes. able to distinguish yes so um if uh you know that the short head is the the one that is most distal at least in a longitudinal view um and or also of course in a, in, a, in a transverse view so if you have a view on the um on the radial tuberosity and you know where the radial head is and thus proximal and you know where the site of the lesion is then you also know if it's long if it's long head or the short head so yes i definitely uh look at that yeah great um the next one is thank you for Thank you very much for a great presentation. On a normal day, how many ultrasounds do you perform and is there a chance to visit you for one day? Thanks in advance. <laughs> yeah. So um, my clinical uh, time is uh, is due to the Sonar Skills company uh, a little bit less. Uh, I only have uh, one day or two days a week and I see patients every 15 minutes. So that's 32 patients in a day. Um, so I see the minimum of, yeah, let's say 32 patients a, a day, uh, sometimes it's, it's 60 in a week, two days. Um, but, uh, the other three or four days of the week, I'm working for Sonar skills, teaching, traveling, developing content, uh, because I only have one or two days a week and, uh, seeing lots of uh, students, uh, uh, I'm very booked, uh, quite booked for the next year with clinical internships. Um, but uh, I might, I'm thinking about increasing my clinical days a little bit and doing a little bit less teaching. So uh, in 2024, let's say after the summer, there might be more room. So feel free to send an email to mark at sonoskills.com and we can definitely discuss options. Great, thank you. Uh, is it difficult to tell a bursitis from a partial tear when only one head is torn? Yes, that is difficult. Yeah. Uh, for example, in the image I showed you, that was the type uh, 1A image. Um, if only part of the tendon is affected, it's fraying and you see a fluid collection. Uh, then the question is, uh, is, it, uh, is, it, is it the tendon that is affected and, and swollen or if, is it a, a, a bursitis? So you need to have a reference library. So you need to have seen, let's say, at least 20, 30 healthy biceps tendons. So uh, to that library in your mind, you're going to compare every pathology image uh, to. So at one point, you are so experienced that uh, you will see it. Cues that can help you is looking at how uh, wide or how thick a tendon is, the dimensions of the footprint. If this footprint is smaller than you would expect it to be, then most likely it's a tendon problem. Um, also, uh, if it's a bursitis with a minor fluid, a film of fluid around the tendon or with the tendon, it's not so clinical relevant. So if I see a bursitis, then we need, it really needs to be a strong fluid collection. So if you really are in doubting, is this fluid from the tendon or maybe the bursa? It's most likely of the bursa because if, if it's a, uh, of, is it most likely of the tendon? Because if it's a bursitis, then most likely the fluid collection is much bigger. Um, I did get some clarification on the quinolones. They are uh, an antibiotic, and is it ah. linked to the tendon rupture? Yes. Uh, so I'm not uh, I'm not familiar with that uh, antibiotic. Uh, so my clinical setting is that I do diagnostic and interventional ultrasound. Uh, I only have one or two days a week. Uh, I'm, I'm, I like to be very good at what I do. Uh, so I have chosen to be good at 
uh, less uh, instead of being less good at a lot. So <laughs> I have chosen to do a perfect diagnostic MSK ultrasound and to stick with corticosteroids when uh, when injecting. I don't do any orthobiologics or PRP or whatever. Uh, so uh, then uh, I will uh, refer the patient to uh, immediate colleagues. Thanks. Um, can you have a Popeye sign with a, with a complete tear of only the short or the long head? No. So okay. for a reverse Popeye sign, so don't let's include the word reverse because a right. Popeye sign is that you have a distal bulging of the muscle belly due to a proximal tear and you have a reverse Popeye sign here because the distal that biceps tendon is torn but it's always the complete tendon plus the aponeurosis if only one part of the tendon is torn you won't see the popeye sign okay uh let me see i think there were other just uh comments there's one more here do you ever use pressure to see if you can deform the tendon because yes, if right. i'm right a healthy tendon isn't going to deform yeah, yeah, yes. So you can definitely use sono palpation. Yeah, that is maybe not something that I do consciously because it's it's just what I do. I know it's part of my routine, right? So you're moving around, turning the transducer, pushing. That's yeah, I definitely do that to see if I can push away fluids or how the tissue behaves underneath the transducer. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, now there's one last one here. Uh, do, um, how do you differentiate post-surgical change after repair um, of a, of a yeah. tear? Yes. So uh, I think that uh, uh, most important, importantly is that, uh, that the tendon is um, uh, intact, that it is repaired again, that you see tendon movement, and that also in time you will see uh, uh, signs of a healthy tendon so that uh, the tendon becomes less hypochoic um, and yeah you have a good view on uh, on the tendon it is possible of course it also pass operatively you will see um, yeah signs of the surgery um, but uh, uh, and and also sometimes it can be challenging because after a surgery a tissue always changes so it will be never the same again uh, but um, what, what we do want to see in, uh, in ultrasound is healthy tendon kinematics, healthy echogenicity, less fluid, and uh, yeah, I think that's, and fiber continuity. I think that those are, and that the tendon is not thickened or enlarged in cross-sectional area. So those are the, the, the checkpoints I assess. Uh, so also part of the student skills pathology checklist. You can also use that for, for, for looking at, for evaluating post-operatively yeah so that's that's how how i look at it okay actually there is one, one more question here mark that popped up and i'm not sure how much you're doing in the pediatric realm but uh um this person says i like the cobra view of the radial head short axis and long axis could we look for the radial head luxation with this view in p in the pediatric patient um yes uh, uh yes and no uh so let's start with no no because cobra position so i, I will <laughs> do it like this um so um the, for to look at the to look at the tendon you are a little bit more towards distal if you go towards proximal so towards the elbow joint then suddenly you will see, you will slip off the distal biceps tendon and you will see the distal radial uh, of the proximal radial ulnar joint. So you will see a nice round radial head. You will see uh, the joint partner, the ulna really close to the, uh, to, the, to the radial head. So yes, so it's almost in this cobra position. It's almost on the tendon, but slightly more to proximal. Then you can observe the radial ulnar joint. But with luxations, uh, in children, uh, to me, it makes more sense uh, to look at the humeral radial joint just in a longitudinal way, as if you were looking at the um, uh, at the common extensor tendon, uh, because then, you, you, yeah, it's 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 a little bit easier to check. Or maybe in ventral position, longitudinal ventrolateral, also uh, looking at the humeral radial joint. So for children, I would use lateral and ventrolateral approach mainly. 
Great. Good. I think so. The rest are just mostly comments, Mark, and and thank you very much. That was uh, excellent. I learned so much um, in getting ready for this webinar and and with your help. So uh, I hope everybody else benefited as much as I did. Um, Janice, thank you. Thank you. do you want to have any closing words? That was a fabulous webinar. So many positive comments. Thank you everyone for all of your questions and lively Q&A session. On our Claris website in the educational tab, you can find access to a library of on-demand webinars and Claris classroom video tutorials that showcase MSK imaging and ultrasound in uh, injected techniques. We also encourage you to sign up for training with the fabulous team at Sonoskills. Also, um, you will all receive a PDF copy of the slides and webinar recording for today's session as well. So do keep an eye on your inbox and we encourage you to please complete our closing survey to give us your feedback so that we can continue to bring you great educational content like today. A big thank you to Mr. Schmitz for sharing all of his best practices and a very big thank you to all of you for joining us today. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and encourage you to keep scanning. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. everyone. Bye.